two. Good evening and welcome to the Cover One Buffalo Podcast. You are joining your host, Greg Thompson, tonight as we go into the next episode in our off-season series of positional previews. Tonight, we are diving into the world of quarterbacks, and who better to do that with than the QB one of our hearts, Nate Geary. Nate, how are we doing, brother? I'm doing very well. How are you? Not too bad. Not too bad. It's uh, it's a lot of fun to be able to kind of – you know, dive in and, and take a look at, at, at football for a minute. I, I've talked on some of the recent shows and I certainly know you have as well about everything going around us and still want to remain active in that world, but I, I'm ready to, to give my, my mind a break for a minute and dive into football and really kind of let ourselves have some fun. So uh, looking forward to being able to, to kind of go into all the, the goodness we have here. How, how are things over in your world? Uh, things are good. I know you're in the middle of your uh, your big move, so hopefully that's going well for you. I'm, you know, I'm good, man. You know, just playing golf. I was uh, at, at lunch today, and I was doing some math in my uh, one of my apps, my golf apps, and I realized that I'm uh, I'm 12 rounds deep, uh, 14 days into this month. So I'm uh, I'm getting out there and playing a little golf. That's good work. That's Decent that's work. excellent work. Decent work. Um, so as we've gone through this series each night we've gone through and it's it's been fun to be able to kind of look through you know we'll do some of the nerdy stuff with where the contracts lie but the quarterback isn't as, as deep of a position as many players you know some of the other spots we're talking 10 11 12 guys and with the quarterbacks obviously it's it's very one-sided so we know where the majority of our conversation is going to go tonight but we'll, we'll run through some of the other pieces uh here so for um i've kind of advertised a lot of this series as a refresher so for i know many of our loyal listeners um this is you know the kind of detail that you're looking for but i've advertised it to a lot of the casual fans a lot of our uncles a lot of our aunts a lot of our family members they, they hear about the bills and they hear hey maybe they're not going to be too bad this year and that I, i've used this series is to welcome them back aboard if you want to be able to talk about the team when you're at the water cooler when we finally get back into the office setting or you're talking to other people and you want to know what's going on with the team or you maybe felt like hey I'm pretty sure they're still going to be terrible but just in case I want to know the names of the players we're going to go through everybody for you here so this series should be a good warm-up we'll do one a week the whole rest of the offseason leading up to the first preseason game and you'll know who's going to be on this team and if perchance we stumble into a good team this year you'll know what's going on so welcome aboard for anybody who hasn't been a, a diehard listener before we look forward to you guys uh jumping in with us today um i'm going to share a screen here to be able to kind of go through a little bit of what we're talking about and you know looking from a contract standpoint obviously this is exactly what brandon bean wanted to build our entire quarterback room cost nine million dollars total that's the 25th highest total in the nfl um, that's exactly what you want is to build a strong, talented team when the quarterback rookie contract window is in the position that it's in. And that's what he's done. It, it's a perfect setup. And, you know, obviously they stumbled into what they felt was a value in the fifth round with Jake Fromm. We had Davis Webb on the practice squad last year. Matt Barkley has been a perfectly functional backup quarterback. And I would say, in my opinion, Nate, that's an average quarterback depth behind Allen. I don't think it's terrible. I don't think it's the best backup situation in the league. I think it's solid and average. Yeah, I, I would say that. I know I've, I've been on record as, as not being the biggest Jake Fromm fan in the world. I think um, this – setup of dollars and cap value and percentage of cap um, is a really good representation of where I think the battles are actually taking place in this room. Um, a lot of people uh, have this assumption that Jake Fromm is a player that is going to walk onto this roster immediately begin competing with Matt Barkley and may really legitimately have a shot to unseed Matt Barkley. And one of those um, the, one of the reasons people are confident in that is, well, Josh Allen doesn't need that veteran type anymore. He's getting to the point where maybe he doesn't need a, um, that, that extra coach in the quarterback room. Um, but I, I don't really sit in that camp, Greg. 
Um, I kind of sit amongst the guys that, that look at the bottom of this quarterback depth chart because that's kind of what this looks like is, is I think it's a pretty reasonable depth chart of how the quarterbacks walk into training camp or even into mini camp whenever those actually begin to happen, right? Um, and I think the real competition that's taking place on this roster is for that number three quarterback spot, and that's between Davis Webb and Jake Fromm. I think one of these guys is likely here, another um, is likely not, unless <clears throat> you know they, they can figure out a way. And if they want to continue to keep three quarterbacks on the active roster, which I would be shocked if they did, I know that they are going to get um, a handful of extra roster spots with the new collective bargaining agreement this year. Um, so they are going to be able to potentially – roster an extra quarterback but is that the spot is that the position on this roster you want to roster an extra player um we know you know it was hard enough getting to 48 um it was hard enough to get to 53 um you know you know add add four or five more roster spots it's it doesn't exactly make all of those jobs easier to uh to figure out but I'll, i'd say that the real competition we're looking at is between davis webb and jake Fromm for that quarterback three spot and i think um, there's a good chance whoever wins that competition will likely be um, on the practice squad. Um, I, I could see Jake from uh, unless the Bills, unless he just had a you know lights out Dak Prescott type preseason, um, where you just don't think you're going to be able to squeeze him on the uh, on the practice squad. Then I think you're talking about a potential of you know do you consider moving on from Matt Barkley or do you want, do you like Matt Barkley as a security blanket? and you keep Jake Fromm around on the active roster and use that roster spot. So um, the, the, the cap portion of this, Greg, is really interesting because, again, I mean, very few teams in the league, and it's only a handful, as you can see, uh, with four and a half, actually less than four and a half percent of their total cap is, is allocated to the quarterback position. That's such a huge advantage. It's the advantage that you hear teams and general managers like, you know, John Snyder in, in Seattle. Um, you hear some of these teams, uh, even, even in Houston, when they're talking about Sean Watson, who's, you know, going to be due for a payday coming up. You hear these teams talk about their window to really feel their most competitive roster when they're paying their quarterback on that and that rookie salary, we, it's, it's something that is generally talked about pretty freely in the NFL is, you know, this is your window to spend cap elsewhere. Um, if you can get really solid above average, even elite level play from a quarterback on a rookie contract in the first four years, um, you know, you're going to be in a really good position to have a competitive over competitive roster around that player. And I think, you know, the bills are seeing the benefit of that right now. The question is, um, you know, can Josh Allen take that step and prove um, that another year of this type of cap space could, could, could really see Brandon Bean execute on a window. Um, and maybe that means swinging for a trade that he wouldn't necessarily swing for, um, for a player on an expiring contract or maybe one year left on a deal and overpay for a type of player because you want to during this type of window. So the step that Josh Allen makes is really going to make a difference of just how aggressive a Brandon Bean maybe gets at the end of this season, which I know is kind of a long ways away, but you know, you, you look at the bigger picture from 30,000 feet um, and you see some really interesting storylines playing out of this quarterback. Yeah, I think you led it up perfectly in in the competition piece of it. I short of a surprise, don't get me wrong. Jake Fromm could come out and light the world on fire and genuinely beat out Matt Barkley. It's not there. It's a non-zero chance, as I, as I like to say. It's that it's in the realm of possibility. It's very unlikely. The real battle is: Does Jake Fromm play well enough? that they don't feel like they can hide him on the practice squad and that someone would scoop him up and that they need to carry three. Like you said, the um, the new collective bargaining agreement gives a lot of flexibility in season, but you still need to get down to a 53-man roster. You still have to cut down mm -hmm. to 53. You get to call guys up during the year. I've, I've made reference before, and we'll talk about it later on in the defensive line show. That's a perfect example of a Daryl Johnson kind of spot where, hey, he was pretty rough in the season last year. We don't think somebody's going to claim him, but it'd be awful nice to be able to bring him up midseason if you need him without having to expose him to waivers, and you can call him up as that 54th or 55th guy. It's a perfect Dean Marlowe spot. It's a perfect mm -hmm. right. you know, Dane Jackson spot. That's the kind of guys that are going to use that. Normally, you know, short of I know uh, J.O. was asking in the in the chat here about what happens if Josh gets hurt. You know, I'll, I'll use the 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 famous uh, quote from from the longtime Colts uh, offensive coordinator about, hey, why don't we practice when, uh, you know, without Peyton Manning? He said, because that's effed and we don't practice effed. <laughs> if Peyton Manning gets hurt, our season's over. It doesn't matter. Right. We don't um, practice. So we don't practice a scenario that doesn't lead us to anywhere. 
Correct. So I'd love to be able to fill Bills fans with uh, hope that don't worry if Josh Allen goes down, everything's fine. It's not fine. Um, (laughs) It's going to be real bad if Josh Allen gets hurt. And I think Matt Barkley is not the worst backup quarterback in the league. If Josh gets hurt for two or three games, I think Barkley can help us win one or two of those games because we have Mm -hmm. great defense and a good running game. And if it's the right kind of home game, we'll be okay. But if he's hurt, I don't expect some Nick Foles run out of this at the end of the season. So, um, you know, obviously the majority of our talk tonight will be Josh, but we want to talk through those pieces. You did point to Barkley's contract in theory if Davis Webb had a resurgence that we haven't seen from him or, uh, you know, Fromm steps forward in a way we haven't seen yet. In theory, you could save $1.8 million if you cut Barkley. I think it's very unlikely that they have so many eggs in this basket and, even relative to the backup quarterback market, a $2 million cap hit is nothing in the backup quarterback market. So Matt Barkley is even a a value from that standpoint. So I'll be pretty surprised if they go that route and, and cut him just because of the safety net he provides and the uncertainty you'd have with a fifth round rookie quarterback. So we'll see where that goes, but I think that it's, it's most likely we have two quarterbacks and if Fromm plays well enough, it would mean that he's the third quarterback on the roster. Very unlikely that it becomes just Allen and Fromm. Basically Fromm is trying out for, can you be the 2021 forward backup because mm-hmm. you play well enough that they can just let Barkley's deal expire this year, walk away uh, happy and move forward with Fromm as the long-term backup. That's what he's competing against when he's in that kind of spot. Yeah, I totally agree with you too. And and again, I, I want to make sure we temper some of the expectations because there are high expectations for Jake Fromm. I think it's really surrounding the college program that he played for in Georgia um, the amount you see a Jake Fromm on national television that maybe you don't see other quarterbacks that were taken in the draft. And, and, and maybe more so you don't fully understand, you know, or, or get a fully nuanced understanding of what Jake Fromm was able to do in college. Eric and I um, did a very thorough breakdown of Jake Fromm, and, and both of us sort of left thinking um, there, is, there is some sort of untapped potential that we do see in Jake Fromm. Like we believe he's a guy that really will benefit um, from, like, NFL coaching. But there is a lot wrong with the mechanics of Jake Fromm. And that's why, for me, he's not ready to walk into an NFL game this year or next year um, and be a player that can, that can like, help advance the roster, like help advance this team's agenda, which is, you know, to be a playoff team. And, and I think if Jake Fromm's put in this situation where he's has to, he has to play meaningful snaps, um, I think it could very well turn into an Nathan Peterman type situation. I think they both lack in the areas of, of consistent arm strength. Um, and because of that, they're really forced to be perfectionists. Um, much like Matt Barkley, Matt Barkley doesn't have exactly that, that, yeah, right. I mean, you you couldn't talk about opposite types of quarterbacks than Josh Allen and then the rest of the three, they both, uh, the, the three of them outside of Josh Allen really lack that, that elite arm strength, or even in a lot of cases in the case of Jake Fromm, Davis Webb and Matt Barkley, I, I think they're borderline uh, NFL arms. Like they are, um, on the, on sort of the cusp of not being that. Oh, yeah. um, and say what you will about Jake Fromm. Barely minimum qualifying requirement. They're and, literally and you, minimum. And you can see how quickly players like that can flame out of the league if they're not put placed in the right system because yeah. they need to be in systems that are really predicated on timing and rhythm. They have to have a ton of talent around them. They need to have a great offensive line. Um, so, yeah, as much as I as I, I think all three guys can be competitive and, and sort of compete for a backup, the idea of any of them seeing meaningful snaps for this team is um, is certainly a nightmare situation. Yeah, and and it's it's something that you know. Uh, again, the questions in the chat, Jo had asked about you know, do we see a big signing beforehand? You know, obviously, I, I joked in our, our cover one Slack channel that like, hey, uh, Colin Kaepernick's probably a better alignment from a skill set standpoint with what Josh Allen does in the game, and he's probably better than Matt Barkley. Um, I, I said it very tongue in cheek, although. I, I don't think it's wrong. I think that statement's probably accurate. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't see that being the kind of move that Sean McDermott or Brandon Bean are looking for from an attention standpoint right now. You know, whatever team, if anyone gives him a camp invite, it's going to be an incredible spotlight on that team. The name that I, the longer we wait, if it gets to the point where Cam Newton is a possible backup and is possibly open to that, I don't think Brandon Bean and Sean McDermott are at the bottom of that, that list. I don't, I don't know when he gets to that point of when no quarterback gets hurt in camp or nobody in preseason to where an obvious starting spot comes open. If it comes to a point where Newton says, hey, I got to chalk up my losses, 
try again for the 2021 market, get myself into a winning team and just try to look like a good soldier to rebuild some image value dollars. I, I don't know that the bills are the top of that list, but I also don't know that they're the bottom of that list. You don't, let's use an example of a real world example, right? Like if you live in the city of Miami, you recognize that you are potentially years of climate change away from not having your city any longer. Like it could be underwater, right? And if you're the mayor of Miami, are you going to fortify your home this year, surround it by um, bricks and sand so that in 50 years, if, 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 or if climate change really does what scientists say it's going to happen, and there's no longer an area that they'd be safe, everyone around it would be like, well, if he's prepping for the worst, what's, what are we supposed to do? Like what that guy's the most, does he know something we don't know? You know, so I think what they want to do, and if you're Brandon Bean, if you're Sean McDermott, um, as much as I think the logical move, um, I, I have firmly said that I think the Bills have a tremendous blind spot at the quarterback position. If Josh Allen has a Teddy Bridgewater, knock on wood, a Teddy Bridgewater type catastrophic injury. Um, if he just flat out just, We've. Seen, I hate using Nathan Peterman's name twice in a um, in a podcast, but here we are. Um, you know, let's say Nathan. He has a Nathan Peterman type beginning of the season where he's literally going out there and throws four or five interceptions in the first game, and is just as bad in the second game. And all of a sudden, because that's the thing with Josh, what we know is if things get murky early, it can snowball on Josh. And if that were to happen in a year with so much expectation early on in the season, and you have to pull him off the field. Like, man, they're just not in the situation where they can overcome that in long term. And, and, you, and that's the thing that you sort of have to have this balance, balancing act with is you have a playoff ready, I think, AFC championship caliber roster. I'm not quite ready to tell you that they're a Super Bowl roster. Um, there are certain boxes that need to be checked and can't be checked until you play football games yeah. to be considered a Super Bowl roster, no matter yeah. what you say in the preseason. Any team, you know. You, you know, I don't think anyone can tell me that the Bills are better than Kansas City or Baltimore, but there's no other AFC team that you can tell me are better than the Bills besides those two. Yeah. So, you know, the, the, if you're already third, that means you have a shot. But, yeah, I, I think they're right in that running. But, yeah, it, it's crazy to put them above what Kansas City or Baltimore did last year. So with that being said, it's like, you know, I, I can totally understand the mindset and the process of saying – you better have a guy you truly can rely on, a guy that can step in and maybe you you don't lose a beat at all with, with your starting quarterback. Or maybe you have a veteran presence that can come in and lead a Super Bowl roster if um, a Josh Allen just doesn't work out or uh, an, an injury happens. Now, can you get a Colin Kaepernick or, or, or um, you know, Cam Newton – and at, at the end of July, can you get him in early August? And I, I guess the question, the answer to that question is, is, I guess it remains to be seen. I am a little surprised to see Cam Newton still available. Um, I, I don't, uh, frankly, I don't understand it. I think there's this perception that he's a um, distraction um, for more reasons than just his off the field. I think a lot of people are concerned in this particular situation of him coming in and, and dwarfing Josh. He's a big personality. Um, if if Cam Newton showed up at St. John Fisher in a regular season in a normal non COVID season, where are the cameras going? Like what, yeah. where are the reporters going during training camp? Are they going to be going to Josh Allen? I, I don't know. Like, I think if Cam Newton's at camp, the story is going to be, well, Cam, are you comfortable being the backup quarterback? And the, the story isn't Josh, you know, what are you doing to take your, your, your year three step? It's Cam Newton. Uh, or, you know, what are you doing to make sure Cam Newton does take your job? And then it just becomes this, this, this sort of circus and storyline. And I think it's this weird balancing act. You have to sort of balance the risk factors um, and what those effects of you bringing that personality on the roster could potentially do. And, and, and I, I'm still, frankly, in the camp that says until this organization, this, this group that's running it right now shows us that um, there's crack in the armor, there's, there's cracks in the foundation of their decision-making process, this is something I need to trust them on. And if they believe they've yeah. seen enough from Josh Allen that you can go into a season with Matt Barkley, um, but also have a plan B, and, and maybe their plan B is Cam Newton, we just don't know. Maybe, maybe they've already spoken to Cam Newton, and there's a mutual understanding that there are situations where we are going to reach out to you, but until those happen, you know, this is nothing more than preliminary. That could be totally the case. In I, I don't think that's crazy at all that, you know, they say, hey, as of right now, we hit, you know, I can see a conversation where Bean and or McDermott say, Cam, 
we think you're a starting caliber quarterback. We don't have a starting spot. If Josh gets hurt, obviously you're our first phone call. If at some point you haven't signed yet and something happens to where we feel like we're not going the direction that we both feel definitively, definitively like we are going right now, if that changes, we'd be open to that. But I, I, th- I would see it as that kind of conversation. We see you as a starting quarterback. We don't have a starting spot available. That's not what we're looking to do right now. If things change for either group, we'll call you back. Right. But I, I think that's the kind of conversation that's out there. Like you said, the certain criteria that those things haven't happened right now, if one of those change, you'd be our first phone call. I, I, I bet that's the kind of conversation that would have happened. Absolutely. And, you know, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't throw away the key that the Bills – could be this type of organization could be the the type that that might if, if if he's off the market that a Colin Kaepernick wouldn't necessarily be off the board. I, I do wonder, you know, from a fan perspective, if this city is mature enough to handle something like that. Um, I would It'd have be a my it'd be a challenge. I, I'd have my doubts about it. Um, but having said that, I wouldn't throw it past. I think they've got easily when Josh Allen says it, I believe it. When other players around the league say it about the Bills, I believe it. I think there's a pretty strong consensus that if the Bills aren't one of the best locker rooms in the football, that they're like they are maybe the best locker room in football. They're the best, you know, in terms of continuity, in terms of just Sean McDermott says it when players come here, they're they're they turn into their, their best selves, right? And I think that's this persona that's not only living with within here in Buffalo, but it, it lives outside of these doors. And I think that's really important. And I think if you're gonna look at one team who has the stability, who has the um ability to take on that type of that type of distraction, I do think it's the Bills. But yeah. um I you know, I, I definitely wouldn't put my money on um, you know, them, and especially, again, I think we're talking about worst case scenarios, which is, is not always necessarily, it's June 14th, I, yeah. you know, yeah. like sometimes worst case scenarios is what we, is what we have to talk about, especially in a, in a situation like we have. So, uh, but I, you know, at, at the same time, you know, I, th- I think we're all, we all sit in a place that we're, we're carefully strategically excited. I think we're all confident to a certain extent. I think there are shades of confidence. I don't think everyone has the same level of confidence in Josh Allen, but I don't think there's, I think that, that, that fraction, that, that, that portion of this fan base that is really just Josh Allen's terrible is, is shrinking and it's very small. And I think we're at this area where we're sort of layered out of, well, just how much really faith do you have in Josh Allen? And I think it really goes from just very little, but I, I, I can see it to he's the guy, he's the franchise. And there's so many layers in between that. I think it's a, you know really important to kind of, acknowledge that and understand that because it's not a black and white thing. It's not just in this fan base, but it's in the national perspective too. So I think that's a perfect lead into to where the next portion of our conversation goes, which is Josh Allen. I mean, we obviously we've queued up now the backup situation. We, we both are on the same page that it's Davis Webb and, and Jake Fromm for that third spot. If one of them played well enough to force a third spot, it would be third. Unlikely that they unseat Matt Barkley. We think it's likely we go into the season with Matt Barkley short of an injury where you were to make a phone call for one of the bigger names out there. And that puts all of our eggs in the basket of Josh Allen. And I've described that in other conversations that all the other moves we've made, what I've described as the best other 52-man roster in the NFL, and I, I believe that. I think that we have the deepest overall roster short of quarterback in the NFL, which means the Stephon Diggs trade, having nine uh, NFL-caliber offensive linemen, having nine NFL-caliber defensive linemen, having the arguably the best secondary in the NFL, the best back seven coverage unit in the NFL, including linebackers, is half of the battle. And the mm-hmm. other half, all by himself, yeah, is Josh right. Allen. And, right? and I think the way to frame it up, I'm going to share some numbers here. Um, it, it's it's not as good as your Miami Mayor sandbag analogy, but I, I'm going to try. Um, the If you look at Josh Allen's second year, played 16 games, you know, 10 and 6. It's counting the the – he didn't really play in that Jets game, so it's really 15 games. Um, you know, 58% completion percentage was over 60% for a good chunk of the year. 3,000 yards, 20 touchdowns, 9 interceptions. I found two other quarterbacks and, and went through with uh, a lot of work Sal Capaccio did. I thought he had a great comparison and dove into that, plus another name that gets thrown out there often that had very similar second years with then very divergent third years. So on the good end of the scale is Matt Ryan. Matt Ryan's second year, again, a winning team, came off 9-5, and 58% completion percentage, 2,900 yards, 22 touchdowns, 14 interceptions. Obviously not the runner 
that Josh mm-hmm. is, but some more passing attempts. On the bad end of the scale, you had Mitch Trubisky. Again, 11-3, and 3, 66% completion percentage, 3,200 yards, 24 touchdowns, 12 interceptions. People dismiss how solid Mitch Trubisky's second year was. Right. People in Chicago thought they had the guy coming off, you know, that season. He was 11 and four. They were 12 and, or they were 11 and three. He was 11 and three. They went 12 and four that year with him as the starting quarterback. They thought they had their guy going into that next year. He takes a, a significant step back, showed pretty clearly he wasn't the guy. Now it looks like they brought in Nick Foles to take their job. Matt Ryan steps forward with an incredible season, probably his second best short of his MVP year. You know, 62% went up another 4%, 3,700 yards, 28 touchdowns, nine interceptions. That was the what Sal put out there was, can you imagine if Josh Allen took that kind of step forward from a passing standpoint while maintaining his threat, if not the raw numbers, Correct. but his threat of the running game, that's the kind of season where legitimately, if that's not even an exaggeration, if Josh Allen had this kind of year, the Bills would go 13-3. to if, if Josh Allen goes 3,700 passing yards, 28 touchdowns, and nine interceptions, the Bills are 13-3. to I think I don't think that's an exaggeration. I think you'd sprinkle in between six to ten more rushing touchdowns. Mm-hmm. Um, I think you can talk about the factors outside of Josh Allen if Josh Allen is able to put those, those sort of – uh, raw numbers up. I think you're talking about a running game that is amplified in its efficiency uh, because they have an efficient passing offense that's a danger. Um, I think you're talking about uh, an offensive line, right, that is likely going to be uh, one of the top units in the league if teams have to respect Josh Allen um, and, and have to play two deep safeties. And, and I think that's one of the big issues is, you know, can Josh Allen beat the cover zero? We, we talked about that a lot in that Ravens game last year. And, and the answer to that question was no, he cannot beat the cover zero look. And he started to have success later on in the season. Dallas, uh, well, Dallas game, he had some success against cover zero. And then that Ravens game happened and everyone was like, well, well you know, what, what do we do from here? Teams are figuring out how to stop Josh. And, and I think, you know, there's going to be phases to defensive coordinators every year that come in and add sprinkles um, and, 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 and be able to, you know, throw something at Josh that he may not have seen before. But I think the most interesting thing about the development process is what it means for everybody else. Last year, you know, I, I know you and I talked about this. We, we talked about, okay, you know, going into year three, there are several players that we looked at, um, Tredavious White, Matt Milano. This is last year, right? That was yeah. going into year three. And we said, you know, if Deion Dawkins, if Tredavious White, if Matt Milano, if one of, one of those three turn into a blue chip, legitimate, like top two, top three player at their position, that changed the dynamics of this team. And one did, Tredavious yeah. White. And I think the other two – Put they themselves took steps firmly, forward. Yes, yeah. I think firmly put themselves in the above average category, the top 10 to 12 in their position. And I think yeah. when you start talking about that this year, you look at this Bills team and the, the players that you look at, Josh Allen. Uh, Dawson Knox is only going into year two, but it Tremaine feels like Edmonds. it's not. Or Tremaine Edmonds, right? But it, it, Dawson Knox feels like an interesting one to me. Like he could be on the verge of something. I, Devin Singletary, right? Like if Devin Singletary takes a step, if the running game's capable of taking a step and they're not, and, and, and you know, Frank Gore is a legend in the game, but he was an anchor. Um, he held the offense back from an efficiency standpoint. When he was on the field, teams knew they were running the football, and he lacked the success necessary to earn playing time. But he did anyway because of as his As a shout-out, anyone who didn't see that Shelkopedia piece that he put together showed exactly statistically how bad Frank Gore held them back. It was yeah. for someone who watched every game and analyzed every game, it was eye-opening how bad it was that we hurt the team by giving Frank Gore touches. It was eye-opening. Eye-opening and for sure. And, I, and that's exactly what I'm, that was sort of the, the piece I was getting at because when you think about all of these other factors that if Josh Allen can be better, there's going to be a residual ripple effect of yes. other positions, other players, other units. And that could be special teams because maybe the punting unit isn't on the field as much. Maybe that means the bills are getting better field position. Maybe that means the bills are putting defenses in better field position or and uh, opposing offenses in worse yeah, field scripts. position. Yeah, Correct. more late, late passing games with your ears. These are, these are nuanced like things maybe we're not thinking about if Josh Allen gets takes that step. But these are all things that you could legitimately look at because I think we're all really confident if, if the Bills defense stays the same, 
man, you know, they're, they're going to be in a really good place. I think, you know, they, they do need to tie some things up in the run game. I think all of us, you know, are, are, are understanding of that. But I think for the most part, if they stay the same or regress just slightly, this is a team that on the offense, if they could take a step forward, there's just so many other factors that, that, that could lead to them being a 13 three team outside of Allen hitting those numbers. That's sort of the important statistic that he, he gets to those numbers. I think you're right. I think they are a 13 win team, but the other things that that would be amplified because of right. that success is really what excites me. Well, you, you talk about last year, it's similar. We talked about the fact that Bill's fans went from the worst offensive line in the year in the league to an average offensive line. And it seemed amazing that we actually had blocking. And really, we just went to a pretty okay offensive line. Mm -hmm. And the, that's a, a good analogy for the offense overall. We went from, at one point in 2018, the worst offense in NFL history at one right. point during the season and ended up being one of the bottom two in the overall league and, and arguably the worst offense in the league to now – okay, slightly below average offense. If we just take another small step forward, we don't need to be, you know, the, the 2018 Rams. We don't need to be the, the, you know, the run and shoot, you know, Oilers of the nineties. We don't have to light the league on fire. And all of a sudden, it, don't get me wrong, that'd be fun. Um, but we just need to take another step forward. If we just go from, depending on what metric you look at, we were 19th to 23rd, that kind of offense, you know, below average, but okay. If we now move that up to 12th to 15th with this defense, all of a sudden people don't realize how big that tilts mm -hmm. those game scripts that you referenced and the situations you put the defense or special teams in, more favorable field goal attempts, more favorable passing down situations where you can now use that defensive line rotation that the off the cornerbacks know that you have to pass and they can get ready that Micah Hyde and Jordan Poyer can disguise more coverages because they don't need to be worrying about you running. It just it tilts each little thing in your favor. Yeah to allow you to do those things. I love that point of all the other little things that it can do. I think that, you know, uh, I, I like some of the steps Josh has taken. I know Eric just pointed out some video breakdowns of, because Eric's a, a psychopath and literally broke down the throwing motion and offhand placement in the Florida workout videos. Cause he's a crazy person. Um, but he talked about the fact that between Josh reaching out and Dable setting it up, Josh talked with Peyton Manning, Brett Favre, and Tony Romo and was going through things with mechanics, off-season approach. The, a couple of the comments came out about Peyton Manning talking to him about organizing separate situational Zoom meetings with himself and the tight ends, himself and the offensive line, going over blitz calls, going over all those different things, set it up himself, and he's doing that. Well, Romo apparently gave him some tidbits on offhand placement when you were throwing, and again, Eric's a crazy person and actually noticed it and took video from his days in college and his rookie year versus where he was showing his offhand placement, especially on some of the, the deeper ball. passes yeah. and how noticeable it was and that how it can give him just that little bit more control, that little bit more confidence, that little bit more stability and consistency. And it's little things like that, that if he's able to rein some of those things in and then you combine that with, you know, last year, hey, on cover zero in a tense situation, he wasn't sure who was going to be open. Well, now he probably feels pretty comfortable. Stefan yeah. Diggs can beat his guy, and you now have that step. Those little things could add up and at minimum put him in a position that we're going to know because we've eliminated so many other yeah, excuses, right. factors of what's there. By the end of this season, we're going to know for better or worse. That's a scary thing to think about, but I, I feel confident we're going to know whether we have it or not. Yeah, that's why, you know, uh, when you talk about worst case scenarios, I mean, I, I, I kind of talked about it on Sports Talk Saturday this weekend. I, I talked about, you know, like what was some of our biggest fears of, of what could happen with a roster that I will, all of us feel really good about. And, you know, one of those things is like an intro to Josh Allen because of everything else that could potentially go wrong, um, with the season going down the, sh you know, down, down the tubes and then having Matt Barkley or all those other things we talked about earlier. The other thing is the creeping in of, of doubt and excuse. Um, and that's the one thing that I think this organization has really uh, passed with flying colors is eliminating, um, you know, developmental and evaluation 
excuses for not only their own bias as an organization that drafted Josh Allen, um, they have to understand that there is a bias that lives within them when they're evaluating Josh Allen is that they're always going to sort of give Josh the benefit of the They doubt. want him you, to succeed. They want him to succeed. Yeah. So does everybody, right? So the people that really want Josh to succeed are always going to give him the benefit of the doubt. And, and an injury um, could really just – prolong an evaluation period for another year and a half. And that's just not where we want to be as an organization. We don't want to be looking at 2022 thinking, okay, this is a big year for Josh. Like we, we, we want that to just be 2022 needs to be, yeah, this is, is Josh getting 40 million a year? Like that, that's, that's the conversation yeah. we want to be having. What we don't want to be having is the conversation we had last year or really this off season, again, two years from now because of an injury that takes a year and a half to fully, you know, because that, that's what we'll talk about is, bro, the ACL really takes a full season and that full season back, we can't really take everything we saw because the knee, you know, and, and that's just, that would be, in my opinion, the worst nightmare of that. You know what I mean? It's just the excuse. And I think, to your point, they've done such a good job of eliminating all of those, those, those excuses, those ancillary excuses. And to your point, Cover Zero is a perfect example of that. You know, now he understands, you know, in, in his mind what he's supposed to do. But now he's actually got a weapon. He's got a, he's got a guy in Stephon Diggs. A that first when read. A def- he's got a first read. When a defensive coordinator is going to say, yeah, you know, Cover Zero is a way to confuse Josh Allen. But – do I have the corner? Do I have the ability to cover these guys one-on-one um, and leave them on an island? And there's going to be more no's to that answer than it was in 2019. Yeah, I just joked with that uh, earlier with someone on Twitter that, oh, that's cute. The Dolphins signed a second guy for $15 million plus who can't, can't defend Stephon Diggs. That's great. Yeah, right. Um, <laughs> exactly right. It, it leads into our final part of the discussion here, and I'm going to bring up another uh, screen to share. It's – bringing up the financial discussion of the new CBA and the impact on Josh Allen. So right now we're in a really strong position. His cap hit this year is 5.8. A first round pick rookie deal is all guaranteed. You can't really get out of any of it. So um, 5.8 this year, 6.9 next year, no matter what. We have two good, solid, cheap years left on his rookie year, rookie deal. The new rules, and Mitch Trubisky's a good analogy for it, is that the hesitancy was some of the situations you saw before where you could pick up the fifth-year option on a player and still kind of string it along. And if you then later on rescinded it, the money wasn't guaranteed. It was only for injury. Uh, It was only guaranteed via injury. And if the guy didn't get hurt and then you decided, eh, we changed our mind, you could rescind the offer and nothing really happened. You were just able to kind of take it back. So the new CBA, once you exercise the fifth year option during the spring of the fourth year. So that's when it would be. It would be after the season completes. We just did it with Tredavious White a a month or so ago. Um, Sometime after the draft, usually it's May 15th is the deadline. Um, We would have to decide, do we exercise the fifth year option? We'll have the same conversation with Tremaine Edmonds and the linebacker show um, on Josh Allen. And at that point, if you do that, both the six point seven million, six point nine million for twenty twenty one, and whatever that number is, and I'll get to that in a second, in twenty twenty two becomes fully guaranteed. He's going to get both of those years. So here's where the silver lining and the risk reward comes in of what you just described. Let's assume that we don't have an injury because that's the really the the biggest question mark you can throw in here is that I think we are going to have a definitive answer no matter what. The new CBA built in an escalator that's now performance-based. Before, it used to just be based on where you were drafted. Instead now, if you are an original designation for the Pro Bowl, not an alternate like Andre Roberts and Tremaine Edmonds were last year and that they got brought on and played, but they weren't original originally voted onto the team if you are an original election to the pro bowl there's an escalator and it moves up to the third to the 19th highest salary if you're not it's the fifth to the 25th highest salary uh it's a, don't quote me on those i'm pretty sure those are the numbers but it's that range at quarterback it makes a material difference if josh mm-hmm. allen does not make the pro bowl his fifth-year option number is $27 million for 2022. If he does make the Pro Bowl, it's $32 million for 2022. Now, some fans are like, oh, my gosh, that's $5 million more. $32 million sounds like a lot. The reason I said I think it's an easy decision is if he plays well enough, 
that we feel comfortable exercising the fifth year option and that we go let's say he has the same season as last year pretty good electric plays some inconsistent things but pretty good we go 10 and 6 again things are just solid I think we're going to exercise the fifth year option. We want to back for another year after that. We want to keep seeing it. We want to see the fourth year and the fifth year to really decide. And they're going to exercise it. And it costs twenty seven million. If we have a season where Josh Allen is one of the three top quarterbacks, and let's say the Pro Bowl is Patrick Mahomes, Lamar Jackson, and Josh Allen, and he's an original election to the Pro Bowl, we're going to feel fine giving him thirty two million dollars because he just yep. had a Pro Bowl season, which means we probably went. 12 and 4, 13 and 3, and we're going to be fine with that either way. If it goes the wrong direction, we're not offering the fifth year option. We're just going to ride out the fourth year and figure out what happened, like we did with Shaq Lawson, and hope that he balls out in the fourth year and we have to use the franchise tag, which is 34 or 35 million dollars. And it's just going to cost that range anyway. So I it's interesting the way the new CBA structured it. It can get more expensive but it's in direct correlation with performance that if he does well, we're not going to feel bad about giving him that money because he earned it. So just to break it down for fans, again, simple. If he doesn't make the Pro Bowl, the fifth-year option decided by next spring after seeing this whole year is $27 million. If he makes the Pro Bowl in an original election, it goes to $32 million, and then you could negotiate beyond there. I think a lot of teams learn from the Rams' mistake that they – exercised the fifth-year option and gave Jared Goff his extension all at once, I don't think we're going to see that happen as often, if at all, anymore. You certainly won't. Let's need uh... – <laughs> He did all the rest of the GMs a favor. That's an easy one to wave and say, yeah, we're not going to do the Jared Goff. <laughs> yeah, and, and again, you know, it's, I, I hate to be the doom and gloom. I, Jared Goff is your worst-case scenario, right, I think. Yeah. Good enough um, to get I, a contract and then bad enough to sink you with it. Yeah, and, and that's why I think you you that's why the fifth year option is there for teams. You know, it's it was a it was it, it was a move that Los Angeles made out of um, panic, um, realizing that they needed to to determine which of their core they were going to keep. And obviously, Todd Gurley is no longer part of that core. And you see the devastating effects it can have on your salary cap um, when you misappropriate that type of money um, before a guy gets his fifth year option. I think they made the mistake on both Gurley and Goff, oh, if I'm yeah. not mistaken. Um, that they made that fourth year, they paid, they signed the extension after they, um, I think they did it for both guys. Am I, am I wrong? On yeah, that no, Gurley was a full year early. That's they had, uh, cause Gurley's was the same as Zeke where they were both holding out with a full year left before it was even getting to the fifth year option. And that what they ended up doing was you could have let Gurley play the fourth year, exercise the fifth year option. And those two would have cost you, I can't remember the number, whatever it was, they ended up only having him on the roster for that fourth and fifth year. But instead of paying him what those two together would have been like 11 million, they paid him like $24 million. For and he's going to count years. and he's going to count a ton against their dead cap. Oh, and the destroyed their season. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Destroyed it. Yeah. They completely mangled that situation. And it's, you know, it's a great, um, litmus test and case study that someone as yeah. diligent as as uh, Brandon Bean is, I don't think was going to go that heavy into the, you know, kind of all in mentality of what Snead did. But it's a great reason of not going that far overboard. Um, no matter what the scenario is, you have to plan ahead. And I, I think we're seeing that right now. Again, we'll get into it for the linebacker and offensive line shows. You know, I'm curious if we see early extensions for Dawkins and Milano. I, it, I felt really strongly it was going to be all of them, Poyer, Dawkins and Milano, all getting extensions. And now I'm feeling more and more like, hey, maybe it's two out of the three and then a franchise tag next year because they might yeah. string it along. I, I don't know what, I, what methods they're going to use. Yeah, you know, I think somebody in the chat just made an interesting point that I, I kind of want to go to before we end things because I think it, it does tie into all this and it has to do with Brian Dable. Yeah. Now, I think maybe the most interesting element to a big step for Josh Allen in year three is what that means for Brian Dable's chances of becoming an NFL head coach. And if you talk to people, yeah. smart people that cover the game, that know the X's and O's, that watch Josh Allen, they all sort of come away and they all sort of tell me the same thing. They say, yeah, Josh took a nice step in year two. Brian Dable's grossly underrated. Yes. Uh, Brian Dable does not get the respect around the league 
um, in national media circuits. Uh, yeah, I was saying not around the league, not around, around the league, around the fans of the around league. the fans yeah, and in the around league, the national he media. He is that's absolutely right, and and I think that's that's part of what I, I think is the concern here for me is let's say Josh Allen does take that that third year step, and let's say that we're in a situation where Brian Dable is getting significant offers. Now the question is. You know, is he looking for the first job that comes his way? Because if the Detroit Lions come calling, if um, a situation that isn't ideal comes calling, Jacksonville, does he say, thanks, but no thanks. I'm in a situation where, you know, I think I might be able to win a Super Bowl. Um, And if you guys, if I'm getting the, the, the bottom feeding teams, um, giving me head coaching opportunities. This won't be the last time I have a head coaching opportunity. Um, th- these are all really interesting questions that you sort of have to ask because going into year four, I would be, I would be concerned about what happens to the offense if Brian Dable leaves and say they aren't able to bring in a, a Joe Brady, right? Like yeah. if, if they can't go get the best college offensive coordinator and they're sort of go, they go, uh, Ken Dorsey, uh, you've never called plays before, but you've <laughs> been here and maybe that's just the natural succession of things, right? Like then you start to worry, well, year four, this is a, also a pivotal year. We know Josh took the step last year, but year four becomes more important because if he takes a step back, man, you're in a tough spot going into year five. You know, so like, and, and again, I, I, I hate to be doom and gloom, but I think these are all conversations we can have because I think it's, a, it's an obvious area you go to you're led to when you talk about a step from josh allen is what happens to brian dable i I, i'm gonna make the case that there's no scenario that we want brian dable as the offensive coordinator in 2021 because either we had a good enough season where people realize hey man we all thought josh allen was not he was never the automatic bust that the draft twitter world tried to make him out to be but the what they misinterpreted as a historic level of opportunity to bust mm. meant he was more likely to bust than almost any quarterback in NFL history drafted that high. NFL teams saw that as well. If they all of a sudden see that, holy cow, he didn't bust, he developed and improved, we weren't sure at first, but wow, look what they did in this third year. That credit is going to go fair or not to Brian Dable that's going to be where that goes and there's going to be a team that says oh I want that guy to come do that for our guy and it will be a good problem to have Mm -hmm. and that I've warned people that hey I actually like the idea of the internal succession planning with Ken Dorsey for the idea of sustainability and I don't think it was accurate last year but I can talk myself into now having multiple years alongside right in Josh's hip pocket, learning from Dable, being ready, especially with the idea of, you know, how what McDermott, how meticulous he is with his offseason planning things of saying, hey, Ken, I need you to prepare as though you're the next guy to call plays here and be ready for that. That, that conversation has happened. So 100%. I don't know that that's the answer, but they've certainly had that conversation that you could talk me into that being the possibility. The other end of that spectrum is if nobody wants Brian Dable as a head coaching candidate, we're not going to want him back as our offensive coordinator again, just out of some semblance of continuity that, oh, we don't want to change the voice in Josh's ear because if he doesn't have a season good enough to where he's getting that, he's now endorsed by Belichick, endorsed by Saban, coached underneath both of them so, uh, national terms, championship terms, offense court his resume checks holy every water box. right i mean he's the only thing no. that he lacks is, is a blessing from the pope and <laughs> you know i think for me it's like you know you look around football circles that's plenty that is that is a nice enough resume to get just about any head coaching um yeah. job in you know power conference five and I, I we shouldn't rule out if you know a great college job opens that brian dable doesn't sure. potentially do that because here's the thing it, it's it's every coach's Brian they Dable, as much guy. as listen, he Brian Dable's from guy. Buffalo. He went to St. Francis High School. Don't 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 ever think that Brian Dable doesn't love the fact that he's the offensive coordinator of the Buffalo Bills. Yeah. But at the end of the day, you know, he he got into coaching and and is in the position he he is in right now because eventually he wants to be a head coach in in the National Football League or in you know Power Five football in in college. So I, I 
I think I, I think I'm in the same boat as you. As I think a best case scenario is um, come 2021 that the Bills are looking for a new offensive yes. coordinator because I think it means um, that this team did everything that it needed to do offensively yes. to put him in a position to take a job. Yeah, yeah. You can I can find a way to thread the needle that it was just good enough, and that I, I this is going to sound weird to say in a separate conversation. I think there's been a backlog of minority coaching candidates who your Eric B enemies, your Leslie Frazier's that have not gotten opportunities that I, I think there might be a market correction this coming off season. And I, I don't want anyone to interpret that as some forced undeserved opportunity. No one's hiring a person because they're a person of color. No to one's check doing a box. that charity work. Charity we, we've work had out. far more qualified people of color. that were candidates that have not gotten jobs. I have a feeling we're going to see a market correction in that in the next couple off seasons. Jalen Richard is another one. Absolutely. It, there's a chance that guys like a Brian Dable could then be what Eric Bieniemy has been the last two years and all of a sudden be the number two choice for three or four jobs and not end up getting one. So I can talk myself into a scenario where we still have a pretty good season. He gets multiple interviews and just doesn't happen to get one of the jobs or the one that he gets offered is a one in 15 Jacksonville job who also got the number three, sorry, a three and 13 Jacksonville job that somehow got the third pick in the draft and isn't going to get Trevor Lawrence or Justin Fields. And all of a sudden, Oh, I don't want that job. You know, that's the only one I I can talk myself into a path where we have a good season and Brian Dable stays, but for the most part, either he's going to be gone and that's a great problem to have or he's not going to be gone. And that's a different problem to have. <laughs> it's it, right. It could be, I think like to your mentioning there, there could be a scenario that he's back and it's a good thing, but I would suspect that that the likelihood of that happening is, 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 you know, one in a hundred. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, we'll, we'll see where that takes us. I, I think that that's the way we want to handle these shows as we go through this off season program is we're going to talk about the depth of the program of that position group. We're going to talk about the roster bubble battles that we, that can be there Um, in other positions. We're going to talk about Brandon Bean's favorite, uh, his comp pick bingo alternative, where that's his cut down day trade targets. I think that that's not in play at the quarterback position, but I think almost every other position on the roster, maybe short of tight end, uh, you have those candidates. We have some guys at the back end of our roster who are going to be struggling to make it that are good enough to be on other rosters, a lot yeah. of them, maybe maybe 10 of them. Um, we are going to see multiple cut-down day trades. We, we didn't see that here in the quarterback group. Then we're going to talk about the starter at the position. We're going to talk about the financials of where that leads us, what those uh, next steps are going to be, what the contract options are, where we're looking at for this year. Obviously, right now we're in a great financial position, and we're hoping that we're making an easy decision that, yes, I can't wait to give Josh Allen $36 million a year, whatever the going rate is. or Heck, I, I hope it's 40 because I hope he plays that well that we're excited mm-hmm. to give him $40 million. That's, that's a, a wonderful problem to have. Um, but either way, that's where the finances of this goes. And, and we'll use some of those comparisons, some of those stat models that kind of show where those things fall from a um, financial situation going forward and, and what our options are. And each time I'm going to try to bring on some uh, enlightening guests such as Nate and some other folks who have expertise in that position group or with the bills as a whole. So, uh, Nate, appreciate you coming on tonight. Pleasure, Why don't you man. let the folks know uh, what are some of the things you have coming up here on, on the Saturday show and everything else you have uh, cooking? Yeah, man. So it's, uh, you know, we are in the June month and we're roughly 40 something days uh, away from when training camps are set to open. Um, So I am preparing for what is going to be a long season ahead, hopefully. Um, But uh, yeah, Sports Talk Saturday, as we get closer and closer to the season, um, you know, more and more national guests, I try to um, bring new fresh voices uh, from around not only the league, but the the country um, across different sports and platforms. Um, so yeah, I, I do that every Saturday. And of course that's 11 to two on WGR. Um, yeah. Follow me at Nate Gary sports on Twitter. And uh, yeah. Thanks for having me, brother. Awesome. Appreciate it. Um, you know, we talked about it here and, and let you guys know that, um, you know, we've shared many different thoughts on our social media platforms. I've talked in depth on some of the other shows about the many things going on around us. Um, We're going to try to use these shows to be an escape and a moment away for you. But each show, I am going to challenge you 
to try to do something good in your community for a neighbor, have a, have a good, honest conversation with someone in your family, have a difficult conversation with someone in your family, do something nice for someone or go talk to someone you don't normally talk to that's outside of your circle. Uh, and hopefully if all of us do a little bit more of that, we can find some good solutions to the things going on around us. So I wish you all well. Appreciate Nate's time tonight. You have been listening to Cover One Buffalo and we are out.